I invite us now to hear these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. They're very familiar words to a lot of people. But what I invite you to do tonight is to listen to these words and try to imagine as though you are hearing them for the first time. Try to imagine that you're hearing them without knowing the end of the story. Try to imagine you're hearing them with fresh ears. And with this, may our hearts, our minds, and our ears be attuned to what God would be revealing to us through this, the hearing of his scripture it allowed. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him or for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on the earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Church, this is the word of God proclaimed aloud so the world may hear his good news. Thanks be to God. Well, I'm going to tell some of you a secret, and some of you guys already know this. But I grew up in the deep south. I grew up in north Florida. And I'm not talking like Florida, the beaches. The city where I lived was probably furthest away from any beach that you could get to in Florida. So when you think of me in Florida, think pine trees, not the beach. But because I grew up there in the deep south, I have a great affinity, a great love for barbecue ribs. I love ribs. I'll tell anybody about ribs all day long. I can tell you the best restaurants already in El Paso to go get good barbecue ribs. Here's a hint, though. If you want the best, come to my house when I'm smoking them. Those are the best. Well, when I was in college, I went to the University of Florida, which is in Gainesville, Florida. Again, that's another one of those places that's about as far away from any beaches you can get to in Florida. Well, my friends and I, while we were there, we heard about this restaurant in a town about 45 minutes away called Newberry's Backyard Barbecue. And on Wednesday afternoons, Wednesday evenings, they had a special. It was all you can eat ribs. All, yeah, my, wow, my son is amazed by that. All you can eat ribs for $8.99. That might tell you about when I went to college, but. It's $8.99. So me and my friends, we didn't eat for the whole day. We had a really light dinner the night before. We starved ourselves the rest of the day because we were going to see just how serious this restaurant was about all you can eat for $8.99. Well, we got in the car. We drove the 45 minutes. We got there. When we got there, the place was packed. We had to wait in line to get a table. But let me tell you, 
When they brought those ribs in that first bite, oh, they were amazing. They were good. I can still taste them now. It brings back some good memories. And pretty soon, that first plate was gone, and we started stacking those, lo- those bones like Lincoln Logs up on the table. We were, we were making ourselves a trophy, you know, just to see how high it could get. And they kept bringing the plates. And it wasn't just all you can eat ribs. It was all the side items were all you can eat, too. All the, the cream corn, corn on the cob, baked beans, coleslaw, you name it. We ate plate after plate, and they kept bringing them. They kept bringing the sides. And if you've ever eaten ribs, you know one thing is true about that. They're messy. You make a mess when you eat ribs. If you eat ribs right, which is getting all the meat off the bone, taking it for all it's worth, you make a mess. you got a mess all over your hands, your mouth. There's just all kinds of napkins and wet, little wet nap things, whatever they're called, all around the table. We finally finished. That stack of rib bones is about that high. If we had had a picture phone, a camera phone back then, we would have taken a picture and put it on Facebook. We didn't have Facebook back then. It's probably a good thing because people might call me something else now. But we got up. We walked to the cashier. We paid. We stepped out to the parking lot, walked to my car. I stuck my hands in my pockets to grab my car keys, and I tried not to look panicked as I searched quickly. I didn't have any car keys in my pocket, and I was hoping beyond hope that that I had left those car keys in the car somewhere because I I had a bad habit of locking my car keys in the car. So I was looking through every window I could find. There were no car keys. I would have been been ecstatic if I had left the car running for the last two hours. That would have been a great thing at that point, but that's not what happened. So finally I gave up, turned to my friends, and I said, I left my keys in the restaurant. There's another thing you need to know about me. I have a really bad habit of taking stuff out of my pockets and setting it down somewhere in random places. I do it with my glasses, my keys, you name it. Luckily, I have a wonderful wife who always helps me find it somehow. It's like she has a sixth sense of where I put things. Well, I figured out I had left my keys on the table, on that messy, rib-eaten Side itemed, half eaten, all kind of mess table. And then you see what they did at Newberry's Backyard Barbecue when they cleaned a the table, they pulled the garbage can up and they went all in the garbage can. They didn't look, they didn't have real plates or real silverware. Everything was stuff you throw away. So it's right in the garbage can. And I took a deep breath. I looked at that garbage can and I dove in. I dove right in because my keys were in there somewhere. And this is before the days of Uber and, and, you know, all those kind of those share rides, car things that, you know, you call somebody up or you get on your phone in an app because we didn't have that. And they come pick you up. Gainesville at that time was way too small to have a cab service. So the only choice was to dig, to dive in. I didn't really dive in. I just put my arms in, started feeling all around, trying to find those keys in the midst of all the half-eaten corn and cream corn and coleslaw and the sheen of just whatever else was in that garbage can. Well, I finally, finally found them. While I was looking, my friends had a pretty good laugh. But I sit back and I think about it. That experience, that experience of losing my keys and having to go trash can diving, It reminds me a lot of Christmas. Reminds me a lot of Christmas. I think about that, the incarnation, you know, that's that big, fancy, churchy word we use when we talk about God coming down to be like one of us, to be with us. And the child at Christmas, and we call call it God, his name for God is Emmanuel, God with us. I think about God coming and leaving the hollows of heaven, the mightiness, the perfectness of heaven to come down to be with us in our filthy, fallen, sinful, sin-filled world. See, God and Jesus of Nazareth, 
a child of Mary and Joseph that we heard, read about tonight. That God, Jesus of Nazareth, dove right down to the trash cans of creation that we had turned it into and came to save the world. He came on that Christmas day over 2,000 years ago, and he's still here today. He's still here today with you and I. He's still here today, and not just with those of us good folks who gather at a church every now and then, but I'm telling you, he is here with each and every person in creation. And he is offering us, offering the world these gifts of peace, love, hope, and joy, of mercy and forgiveness, of grace. He's coming. He came to help set the world back right again after we had done a pretty good job of messing it up. And for many of us, this, the Christmas story that we read from and, and that you heard tonight, it's a familiar story. It's so familiar that we are really good at glossing over some of the details and some of the characters of the story. And one of the, character, one of the group of characters that I really identify with in a lot of ways and really love are the shepherds. To the shepherds and our nativity scenes and all those kind of things like the one we have here, they tend to be reverently bowing. They tend to be kind of pretty well dressed, reverently bowing, quiet, just sort of in perfect harmony as they worship the Christ child. And when we see them like this, they are the perfect model of that proper response of what it means when we hear that Christ, our Savior, that the Savior is born. And what we read about in Scripture, that is the perfect model. They, they hear it, they're invited, and they go and they seek Him. Imagine what the world would be like today if we all did that when we heard that message. Imagine what a different place it could be. But, but if we were to go back 2,000 years, and if we were to put ourselves in the place of the shepherds that night, if we were to put ourselves in their shoes and experience what they experienced, we'd experience something very different than what we see in our nativity scenes and what we see in our cute children's pageants where the, the shepherds, you know, typically we have the smallest kids do the shepherd role because they don't say anything. They just have to stand there. And if they move around a little bit, it just adds to the mystique. And they're usually wearing really baggy clothing because we, you know, we do the costumes for the biggest kid and the rest of them just kind of have to fit in what's there. But if we were to go back 2,000 years ago and put ourselves in their place, we'd experience something very different than what we see in our nativity scenes and our pageants. Because 2,000 years ago, shepherds were among the dirtiest, loneliest, and most avoided people in Israel. Nobody wanted to be around the shepherds. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, he cusses like a sailor. And for the Navy folks in here, you'll be all right. I'm Army. They're better. Army's better than Navy. But, you know, that's a different story. You can come see me afterwards. But you've heard that phrase, he cusses like a sailor, because, well, if you've ever been around sailors, you know what I'm talking about. Well, in Jesus' this day, there were a couple sayings like that. One is, he lies like a shepherd, or he stills like a shepherd. In other words, when you wanted to cut somebody down, you wanted to talk badly about somebody, you called him a shepherd. Because nobody wanted to be the shepherd they were the outcast of society. They had this terrible reputation. And it was a lonely, it was a hard life. They were being among some of the lowest of society. But yet, but yet it was the shepherds. It was the shepherds who first God, that angelic news bulletin it was the first, the shepherds were the first that God came to to announce the birth of Jesus. It was, they were the first ones to hear, I bring good news to you. I bring God bringing good news to the lowest of society. 
They were the first to hear that the Savior was born, and they were the first to hear peace, God's peace proclaimed. And then not just were they the first to hear, then God invited them to go. God invited them to go see his son. God invited them to go see this holy, infant child. What in the world was God doing? Inviting the lowest of society. Inviting the most despised group of people to go visit his son. I have to wonder if... If those words and, and this honor, I wonder what it must have felt like for the shepherds. Because the shepherds knew their place. They knew nobody liked them. And I wonder if they felt like before they approached this holy child, before they approached the Messiah, the Savior, I wonder if they felt like they needed to wash off all the, the slime of all that cultural stigma before they went to see him, before they felt worthy enough to approach him. And I wonder... I wonder what hearing those words, peace on earth, peace to you, good news to you, I wonder what it meant to them, to those shepherds who often live very hurried, frenzied, and dangerous lives. But what about us? What about you? What about I? What about me? What about our friends? What about people we know we come across? And the sounds of Christmas carols, they play throughout. If Let me ask, how many of you guys have been to the mall this year to go shopping for Christmas stuff? You can put your hands up. Wow, a lot of Amazon shoppers. <laughs> nice. Well, if you happen to go into the mall or to Walmart or wherever to go shopping, or if you were riding in your car listening to the radio station, or if you watched any TV and had to watch and sit through all the sappy Christmas commercials. Or, God forbid, if you're one of those fall Hallmark movie, Christmas movie fans, I feel sorry for your spouse who's not. When you hear those carols, when you hear the songs, song that are all constantly on the radio and constantly feeling the backgrounds of all this stuff, it often, for us, brings up these warm and fuzzy feelings, good feelings. It's Christmas. It's a beautiful time of the year. I mean, it's a celebration. It's a time we gather with family. It's a time we gather in the church to celebrate the birth of Jesus. But there's some people, I imagine some that are gathered here, and some that you know, for whom Christmas is more than just warm and fuzzy feelings. Because holidays like Christmas for those people can be some of the toughest times of the year. For those who have lost a loved one near a certain holiday, when, they, when that holiday comes around, it brings up those memories. Or for those who are experiencing the first Christmas without that loved one, that good friend, whomever it may be, it's also not always the happiest time of the year for those who find themselves estranged from family members for whatever reason. For these folks... Christmas brings up mixed feelings because on the one hand of the scale, you have the celebration of the birth of the Savior, and you have all of the beautiful memories that you've experienced from Christmas's past. And then on the other hand, you have these feelings of pain, these emotions, this hurt, and this disillusionment that you feel in the present. And for those that are here on this side, we search for hope, that hoping in some way that next year, next Christmas, next holiday, it'll be easier. And we desire, we desire that peace that was promised to those shepherds. We desire that peace that was promised to the world. That peace that we heard about in the angel's message. We desire that promised peace. Hear me on this. Out of the frenzied hurriedness of our lives, out of the emotions that stack up upon us, there is a sign of peace. There's a sign of peace given to you and to I. There's a sign of peace given to the world and the birth of Jesus. And it's a divine call, a text, a tweet, a notification, whatever works for you. And it's that divine 
word from God to the world and to all people. It's a promise that there is hope. It's a promise that there is hope not just for you, not just for this state, not just for this church, not just for this country, but there is hope for the world. And a hope that promises God's peace. So for those who might be struggling with some kind of personal problem, whatever it may be, that promise of hope, it's a promise of healing. For those who don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that promise and that birth of Jesus is a glimpse into God's love for all. For those who feel like the whole world is stuck or going down in the violent throes of chaos and confusion, it's a moment of respite and a moment of reflection. And for those who are in the darkness and the fear, that birth of Christ that we celebrate on Christmas, it casts a great light that a new day and a new life is coming for each and every one of us. And for those of us who on this night find ourselves at, odd, at odds with someone, it offers peace. It offers peace from the trenches of life because that is where Christ came to be with one of us. Christ did not come and sit on a big throne in the greatest mansion, in the most powerful kingdom. Christ came, was born in a manger. Christ came to average everyday parents and lived an average everyday life. We have a Savior who comes to meet us where we are, how we are. Who comes into the trenches of life and offers peace. Peace given, just like it was given to parents who were rejected in their hour of need. A peace offered and given to shepherds, the most despised of society. And peace offered and given to all of us who are invited to come and see, to come and experience, to open ourselves up to all that God has to offer. So church tonight and this Christmas season, which by the way is actually just beginning, this is just trivia for you, the 12 days of Christmas when you're playing Trivial Pursuit, it's the 12 days after Christmas not the 12 days before, just so you know. But in this Christmas season, may we strength, may we accept the strength, and may we seek it to accept God's offer of peace to each and every one of us here. The church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.